Russia, 1917. The communist persecution of the church begins. Priests and bishops are arrested, imprisoned, put to death. Historic churches are reduced to rubble. Sacred icons are thrown into bonfires. The darkest night descends upon Russia. Russia today is a miracle in progress. The long, dark night of communist persecution of the church has finally ended. Mass is once more being celebrated openly in Moscow at the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, at the parish church of St. Louis. In St. Petersburg, at the Co-Cathedral of St. Catherine. The Seminary of Mary, Queen of the Apostles, is filled with dedicated young men studying for the priesthood, and a Catholic Archbishop once again celebrates the sacraments with his flock. Father Walter Chiswick, a remarkable American Jesuit priest, foretold this miracle as long ago as 1963. He was born in 1904 in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, a small coal mining town in the Diocese of Allentown. When he was growing up in Shenandoah, in, you know, St. Casimir's Parish, he spent more time playing hooky from school than actually going to school. And he, he, was, he was, in his own words, a tough, which to him in those days meant a bully. You know, he used to pick fights just for the sheer fun or heck of picking fights. And, uh, so much so that, you know, his, his dad, who was a very uh, good man, worried about him, you know, and I thought he had, might have a kind of a, what we would call a juvenile delinquent on his hands, took him once to the police and uh, asked him to lock him up, which they wouldn't do, but I mean, but I think he was trying to, you know, tell Walter, uh, you know, this has got to stop. His mom was apparently a very, very lovely and, and uh, pious lady, so he always attributes his vocation to his mother. Walter himself decided, just kind of like out of a clear blue sky one day, that he was going to become a priest, which his, his father found incredible when he told him. And uh, his mother simply said, well, if you're going to be a priest, then you have to be a good one. You know, right out of eighth grade then, he went off to Orchard Lake Seminary in uh, Michigan because a number of, of uh, boys from, uh, from Shenandoah were there. He was a great athlete, uh, you know, he loved sports. I guess he loved sports almost as much as picking a fight, or maybe he loved sports because it was physical contact, I don't know, but he was a good athlete. And typically Walter, uh, even when he went to the seminary, you know, with this idea that he was gonna be a priest, he didn't want anybody to think that he was pious, okay? So he, he would go to the chapel by himself after lights were supposed to be out and the, and the students were supposed to be in bed, he would go down to the chapel and pray. He did all kinds of things, however, on his own to, to, to be tough, okay? One year, for instance, he went the whole year without eating any meat. And nobody, because he'd read that in the life of some saint, okay? And he figured, well, if the saints could do it, I mean, I could do it. One Lent, he just, he just bread and water was all he ate. And of course, he would never tell his spiritual director what he was doing because, of, you know, this was Walter's idea. While he was in the seminary, he first heard of a young Jesuit saint by the name of Saint Stanislaus Koska. Now, Koska came from an aristocratic family in Poland, and and when he wanted to become a priest, his parents 
didn't, you know, absolutely forbade him because, I mean, the aristocracy, they needed him as the scion of the family to, you know, carry on the line. So, so they said no. So he ran away from home and he walked all the way from uh, Poland to enter the society. Waller thought that was great. <laughs> he got mad at all of these very pious statues of, of St. Stanislaus. Waller figured, no, that couldn't be Stanislaus Koska. He was just like me, okay? I mean, he, he had a mind of his own. He argued with his father. He walked, you know, a couple of hundred miles to enter the society. So that's what I'm going to do. My gosh, he gets on a train. He goes up to New York to, because that's where the, the Jesuit headquarters were for the East Coast in those days in, in New York. So he goes up to New York, he doesn't know a soul, he doesn't know, never met a Jesuit, uh, but he finds out where the provincial residence is and he shows up there one afternoon and he says, I want to see the provincial. Inspired by the example of his hero, St. Stanislaus, the young Walter Chiswick did manage to see the provincial and he would not leave until he convinced him that he should be accepted into the community as a novice. He got this letter in Shenandoah, by that time he was back home for the summer, telling him that he was admitted and he should report to St. Andrew on the Hudson. And that was when he told his father. He hadn't told his father or his mother that he'd applied for the society. So he got in a big, big fight with his dad. You know, his father said, no, you're not. You're going back to Orchard Lake. Finally, he said to his father, look, I'm the one that's going, not you, and I'm going to St. Andrew on the Hudson. Walter Chiswick was ordained a Jesuit priest on June 24, 1937, in Rome. He had gone there to complete his seminary studies. In response to a call from the Holy Father, Pope Pius XI, for volunteers to work as priests in communist Russia. Father Chiswick entered Russia secretly in 1940, hoping to provide priestly service to persecuted Catholics. Father Chiswick was convinced that once there, he would show God what great things he would do for him. It would be many years before Father Chiswick would leave Russia. When he finally did, it would be with a very different conviction, born of much suffering. The conviction that in Russia, God had shown him how much he would do for him. He was arrested by the secret police and held as a prisoner from 1941 until 1963. First, for five years of solitary confinement in Lubyanka prison, Moscow. Then for 18 years in the labor camps in cities of Siberia. He always made the most of every opportunity to serve the spiritual needs of every person he met in spite of the great risks and dangers to himself. He saw work as the common lot of mankind, you know, generically. And, and, if, and if this was where God placed him, and if this was what he was asked to do, then he was going to do it to the best of his ability. Not, as I say, not for the Soviet Union, but for God. And he was going to be an example to others of accepting what it was that God was asking. It was, it was a marvelous sense of both humanity and faith that all of us are called to labor in the vineyard of the Lord. But he saw the whole of his day as ministry, okay? And, and the work that he did which was not necessarily priestly work. It was work in the coal mine. It was work in the copper factory. It was work in whatever assignment he was given, okay, was, was given to him as much by God as it was by the brigade leader. And, and he did it to the best of his ability. It was all of a piece with, with his spirituality. He did that the rest of his life. Whatever he did, because he had the sense that it was God's will, he, he did it as, as well as he could do it. After his release from the work camps, Father Chiswick continued to be held in Siberia. The communist authorities forced him to move from one city to another in a vain attempt to put an end to his priestly ministry to the large numbers of Catholics who had also been exiled to those cities. Finally, in 1963, Father Chiswick was returned to the United States in exchange for two Russians who had been arrested for spying in Washington. 
Whenever he was asked if the faith would return to Russia, Father Chizik would smile and say with deep conviction, the faith has never left Russia. It remains very much alive in the hearts and souls of the Russian people. One day, in God's good time, it will flourish once again. Father Chizik died in 1984, more convinced than ever that the day would come when the faith would again flourish in Russia. At long last, that day has come. And with its coming, it becomes more and more evident that in the mysterious workings of God's providence, Father Chizik contributed mightily toward that rebirth of faith through his patient endurance and faithful witness. Archbishop Kondrasevich, the Apostolic Administrator of European Russia, is convinced that Father Chizik and the many other priests who suffered as he did played a key role in bringing about the present revival of the faith in Russia. Let me tell you one story. City Perm is situated in, Ur in Ural region. Is the city of, is the place of gulags. And uh, church was closed in 1936, as far as I remember. And we we, we received the church back in uh, 1994, 1995. For the first time, I uh, visited the city and for the first time said mass in the church in 1996. After the mass, people asked me, Bishop, let's go to the cemetery. Not, not so far, but let's go. We went together. And they brought me to the grave of the first priest who built this church, who was died in 19th century. No one of these people remembered this priest, but they knew about him from their babushkas, from their grandmothers, grandfathers, and so on and so on. And one lady told me, Bishop, for 60 years we didn't have the church. For 60 years we didn't have the priest. But for this time, for these 60 years, we had this grave. And we used to come here on Sundays, and we were praying here. And we felt this priest was among us. He was teaching us. He was giving courage to us, giving hope that, that things uh, would change. Even we used to confess our sins here in this place. And because of this grave, we were able to conserve our faith and we were able to transmit, to, uh, to transfer this faith to our uh, children, uh, to, to new generations. The Archbishop maintains that the present rebirth of the Church in Russia is due in large measure to the suffering of the martyrs of the Soviet era. For that reason, Father Chizik has a special place in his heart. Father Chizik, he spent a lot of time in Russia. He spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union, suffering, defending uh, Christ, defending the Church, and defending his uh, 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 fidelity to Christ. It was not easy. So he had to feel himself as a Russian because he was among Russians. Catholic Church in Russia is a church of young people. Fifteen years ago, twenty years ago, there were only old ladies in these two churches. Now we see absolutely different things. So it's a sign uh, and it's a hope for us for future. If you have young people in the church, you can be sure that the church has its uh, future. A very visible sign of the rebirth of the church in Russia is the rebuilding of the churches which had been destroyed or desecrated by the communists. The beautiful and historic Moscow Catholic Cathedral Church of the Immaculate Conception had been seized by the communists shortly after the revolution and converted into a factory. It was recently returned to the church. Its restoration to its original beauty is seen by Russian Catholics as a symbol of the healing of the deep wounds inflicted upon the body of Christ 
during the communist era. A small space deep in the crypt of the cathedral has become the setting for yet another Russian miracle. Its name is Svet Evangelia, Light of the Gospel, the Russian Catholic newspaper. Victor Hrul, who also serves as a professor of journalism at the Moscow State University, is editor of the newspaper. I heard of Father Chizik for the first time from the rector of the Rusikum, the Russian seminary in Rome. He told me about those who studied there, then came to Russia to serve as priests. It was very dangerous. I know that Father Walter was arrested and sent to the labor camps where he tried his best to help people, although it was very difficult. Father Chizik's words about the return of the faith to Russia were truly prophetic. If Father's books were translated into Russian, they would help us to remember those who suffered. They would make a deep impression on our young people. We do admire the saints of all ages, but I admire the saints of the 20th century even more because we live in the same times in which they lived. They give us hope that we can follow their example. Father Chizik did that for us. Father Walter Chizik was a great man. Many young Russians did manage to hold on to their faith in spite of 70 years of atheistic indoctrination. From among them, an impressive number have answered the call to serve the church as priests. The need to accommodate them has led to another recent unfolding of the Russian miracle, the reopening of the Catholic seminary at St. Petersburg. Theology professors from many nations have answered the Archbishop's call for help in providing for their priestly formation. In the short time since the seminary reopened, its enrollment has more than doubled. At the beginning of the 2001 academic year, there were 80 seminarians there. One of them, Victor Belotus, is the grandson of a Lithuanian family which had been exiled many years ago from their homeland to Siberia. It was secret. My grandmother baptized me in secret. She baptized all of her grandchildren like this. My parents were religious, but they were afraid to teach me how to pray. Up until the time I was a student at the university, I had not heard about Father Chizik. It was still very dangerous to talk about such things. When I entered the seminary at Novosibirsk, I began to hear a lot about him. The Jesuits were in charge of the seminary. They knew all about Father Chizik, and they shared with us what they knew. I also read about Father Chizik. What made the deepest impression on me were the passages from his autobiography, especially those passages which told about his time in prison, about the questionings at Lubyanka, and how he came to understand that he is a human being, and all human beings are weak and need God. My grandfather was a prisoner in the same labor camp as Father Chizik. He told me of the times that Father Chizik encouraged him and helped him find the strength to keep on going. When I am ordained, I will go back to Siberia. I want to minister to the children and the young people there. They are our hope for the future. Before Father Walter was sent to the work camps in Siberia, he was held in solitary confinement for five years at Moscow's Lubyanka prison. Now, Lubyanka was, uh, was an old hotel. It's, it's right down, it's, it's maybe two and a half blocks from Red Square. It's right down in the center of the city. It was the NKVD prison. I mean, it was kind of like the Secret Service prison. There was a regular drill, a day-to-day a, a -day drill. So what Walter did was he took that drill, okay, and he converted it back into a novitiate. And he, he organized his day around the daily order that he remembered as a novice. You know, five o'clock in the morning, you get up. And so you would make your morning meditation, you would say your prayers, okay? Then, then he would say mass. Now, of course, he couldn't say mass, but, but he would say all the prayers of the mass, okay? He would, which he had memorized. Ironically, fewer than 100 yards away in the Church of St. Louis, Mass continued to be celebrated daily for the members of the Moscow diplomatic community. One of the pastors is Father Viktor Voronovich. When I 
When I first came here to St. Louis Church, there was one very old priest here. He was 90 years old. For many years, he had been the only priest in Moscow. The parishioners were also very old. Everyone was afraid to come to Mass here, because the church is almost surrounded by the buildings of the KGB. They even had a surveillance camera trained on the entrance of the church. Father Voronovich attributes the rebirth of the Russian church to the inspiring leadership of the Holy Father and to the suffering of those who were willing, even to die, to keep the faith alive. We have deep reverence for all those who suffered during the years of persecution. I know of many priests, like Father Chizik, who were in prison or suffered in the labor camps in Siberia. They are very special to us. We revere the memory of those who died there. We have deep respect for the people who survived and now come to Mass with us here at St. Louis Church. And so, Father Chizik had come full circle. In the crucible of Lubyanka prison and in the labor camps of Siberia, his exaggerated sense of self-sufficiency had been stripped away. In return, he received the most precious gift of learning again the lesson his immigrant parents had taught him so long ago. It was the lesson that if he trusted God, God would do everything for him. Throughout the long years of communist persecution, a secret army of babushkas had been quietly sharing that same lesson with their grandchildren all over Russia. Every day, our family, not only my family, but other families, father, mother, children, we were kneeling together, we were saying a daily prayer together, loudly together. And after the evening prayer, usually our babushkas, grandmothers, grandfathers, or our fathers, they used to ask us catechism. They were teaching a little bit, not, not very much, but a little bit. But every day, every, it was systematic catechization, every day. It was real domestic church, this rosary, litanies, and common prayers, simple prayers, simple catechism, question, answer, question, answer. Maybe they didn't know how to explain all this theory and so on, but they gave us what they had. And they gave us this uh, uh, faith, of God, uh, of God, and uh, developed and strengthened and gave us also hope. Father Chizik had given the people of Russia a great gift in his willingness even to lay down his life for them. But he would always be the first to admit that he had received an even greater gift in return. It was nothing less than the pearl of great price. He had given everything to purchase it, but he had purchased it not so much for himself as for the people to whom the Lord would soon miraculously return him. A lot of uh, tourists, not only tourists, but organized uh, pilgrimage groups are coming to Russia. And uh, they, they, they like to meet with me, with other bishops or with some priests and so on. And usually after staying here one week or two weeks, they say, this time for us, it was a time of uh, spiritual retreats. We are giving you material support. We are praying also when we, we, we have been praying for a long time, three generations, even more, and we are very thankful, we are grateful for that. But now when we came here, we also were receiving. So it's fulfillment of uh, um, decision of the first uh, extraordinary uh, synod of uh, uh, European bishops from 1991, Scambio de Idoni, uh, exchange of gifts. So we, we, we receive this because what, what can we give to you? For Americans, we say that everything is clear, everything is okay, <laughs> this country is prospering and so on. But there are other things, this experience, this, these graves, what I mentioned, or, or, or some other things, uh, they can learn. So, Father Chisek also learned a lot of things here, and I think he was more stronger in his face and uh, more experienced, and uh, he could be a witness of Christianity in, in, in general sense, uh, more stronger uh, when he came back to the United States from the Soviet Union than uh, before he came to the Soviet Union. It was his conviction that God wanted him to come back so that he could tell people 
what he had learned about the ways of God. Every day is a gift from God. Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow you're not promised. Today is the gift, okay? So when, the, so when today begins, you receive it from God as a gift from God. And the, and the people and the, and the situations in which you find yourself that day are God's will for you. See, that, now that's where Walter is now when he's talking about God's will. It's not out there somewhere as a kind of a mysterious plan that you have to discover and then you do. No, it's, it's, it's get the you, get the I out of the picture. Today is God's gift, so therefore today is God's will for me, and I accept it and act in it as God would want me to do. Through his books, his letters, and his spiritual direction, he shared that gift with all who came to him in the years which remained after his return to the United States. Finally, completely exhausted from a lifetime of total giving of himself, he died peacefully on December 8, 1984. His cause for canonization was introduced on October 11, 1990. It continues to be pursued actively. Father Chiswick's body now rests peacefully in the Jesuit Community Cemetery at Wernersville, Pennsylvania. But like that long ago priest in a grave in Perm, he remains very much alive in the minds and hearts of the multitudes he continues to inspire through the example of his courageous life. <laughs>